This is how they went. Atlantis, the city that sank into the ocean, and all the other kingdoms that vanished, leaving the same legend in all the languages of men and the same longing. Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand has sold something like 8 million copies since it was first published in 1957. How does a thousand page book like this continue to have such an appeal 60 years after it's published? I think it has something to do with the book's particular take on the concept of idealism. Uh, consider for example the imagery of Atlantis, which appears throughout the novel. To many of the characters, it represents something like an unattainable ideal. You can see this in the case, for instance, of the heroine of the novel, Dagny Taggart. Dagny Taggart is the consummate idealist. Rand portrays her as the operating vice president of a transcontinental railroad. Really, she's running the entire railroad. In her early notes on Atlas in April of 1946, Rand writes that she intends to portray Dagny's hunger for her own kind of world. She works so fiercely because she knows she can have her world only by creating it. You, whoever you are, whom I've always loved and never found. You, whom I expected to see at the end of the rails beyond the horizon. You, whose presence I always felt in the streets of the city and whose world I wanted to build. Daphne has contempt for the sort of so-called idealist that has a woozy vision that he doesn't know how to put into practice and that he doesn't expect to be able to achieve. She thinks all values, all ideals have to be achievable. A genuine idealist is someone who has values, understands why they're worth achieving, knows by what kinds of actions he can bring them into existence, is working to bring them into existence, and who expects to succeed. And this is the sort of idealist that Daphne herself is. She talks at one point about having started life with a single absolute, that the world was hers to shape into the image of her highest values and never to surrender to a lesser standard. And that's what we see her doing throughout the novel. Always whatever obstacle she comes up against, she's trying to bring her values into reality, trying to live them in the days of her own life, trying to create the world as she envisioned it as a young person. And she does. She reaches many of the things that she thought would be milestones on the way to that world. And yet, she doesn't find herself living in it, and it doesn't seem any closer. If anything, it's more and more remote from the hours and days of her actual life. Even though I am never to win, I will go on to be worthy of you on the day when I would have met you, even though I won't. If you fail, as men have failed in their quest for a vision that should have been possible, yet has remained forever beyond their reach, if like them you come to think that one's highest values are not to be attained and one's greatest vision is not to be made real, don't damn this earth as they did. Don't damn existence. As it begins to seem that Daphne's own highest values might be unachievable, she finds herself in a tremendous conflict, and it's both an internal conflict and a conflict with some of the people who are most important to her. I will fight for it, even if I have to fight against you, even if you damn me as a traitor, even if I am never to see you again. Go out to continue your struggle. Go on carrying unchosen burdens, taking undeserved punishment, and believing that justice can be served by the offer of your own spirit to the most unjust of tortures. I don't think it's giving away any spoilers to mention that Ayn Rand endorses the kind of this worldly idealism that Dagny represents in this book, but she also thinks that for this idealism to work it requires a lot of rethinking about our common assumptions about values and the way we relate to one another, and that's what the philosophical side of the novel is all about. You have seen the Atlantis they were seeking. It is here. It exists. But one must enter it naked and alone with no rags from the falsehoods of centuries, with the purest clarity of mind, not an innocent heart, but that which is much rarer, an intransigent mind, as one's only possession and key. At bottom, 
what Atlas is about is the role of the mind in human existence. But a big part of that is offering us a vision of what's possible to each of us as human beings and how we can achieve it. But in your worst and darkest moments, remember that you've seen another kind of world. Remember that it will be waiting and that it's real. It's possible. It's yours.